Hello and welcome to Postgres FM, a weekly show about all things PostgreSQL. I am Michael, founder of PG Mustard, and this is my co-host Nikolai, founder of Postgres AI. Hey Nikolai, what are we t- discussing today? Hi Michael, we uh, we are reacting to requests and we are discussing Vacuum. Maybe we, we're only starting to discuss Vacuum. Yeah, absolutely. Like, deep, deep topic. Huge, um, huge, yeah. But yes, this was, as you say, I think this was one of the first ones somebody uh, tweeted us once once we said we were open to talking about things people wanted to hear. A vacuum was a, is always a topic that people want to talk about. It seems like it's something that uh, people don't necessarily know about when they first uh, encounter Postgres, but they quickly learn about one way or the other. Uh, and as you get more and more advanced, I think there still seem to be things that people can learn about vacuum, uh, even with people with many years of experience right right and uh, yeah right. we, had, we had a couple of requests and i wanted to thank everyone who provides feedback to us uh, we see it almost all, every day already especially on twitter and it's so good to to read it to read it and to see what people think about our show and also as usual i ask everyone to like in in the place they they listen or watch, we have a video version which is uncut, by the way, longer a little bit on YouTube. Uh, Postgres.tv is a short uh, short web address, um, and all, but of course it's available on iTunes and so on. And I, I encourage everyone to like uh, this the show or this episode right now, and also please share in. Uh, social networks you use or uh, groups, working groups where you discuss Postgres or engineering or everything. Thank you so much, everyone. So, uh, spe- speaking of Postgres TV channel, we also have uh, great uh, guests uh, coming almost every week. It's called uh, o- Open Talks. Uh, the idea is we invite people who uh, presented some interesting talk t- at some conference, but recording was not done. And one of the such talks recently was uh, Hanu Crossing uh, X Skype. He, c- he created a lot of, of Postgres related stuff at Skype, and uh, he's now at Google Cloud. Uh, and the topic was the, the talk was titled "Do You Vacuum Every Day?" So I it, it was great. Like it's a very great, deep at the, and at the same time very simple material. Everyone can watch it and understand a lot of stuff. So I, I again like encourage hundred percent everyone should watch this. And the, so so it's it's directly related to our today topic. And it, I watched that. I thought it was fantastic. Um, he managed to keep it as you say, kept it simple, but I definitely still learned a few things during it. I think it was about an hour, maybe a little bit longer. So it is definitely a deep deep dive, but. Um, we yeah, we don't we don't well watch. We, we don't limit uh, our speakers uh, with timing. Like un- unlike at conference, when we have very strict constraints, so we we can say we, we can we can spend a couple of hours definitely if you if you want and you have material and desire definitely so. But uh, our show is uh, roughly thirty minutes because, uh, as usual, I I want to say big hello to those who are running or riding bicycle or especially walking their dogs. I know some people do it. I, I like from feedback I've learned it, and I, I think dogs must love our show, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's their excuse to get out. Uh, I think dogs and elephants would be friends too. Uh, right, uh, keep it in right. the spirit. Yeah. Right. So vacuum. Uh, let's talk about where, where to start. What do you think? I think probably right at the beginning, right? So why do we have vacuum? Like, what is vacuum? Why do we have it? It's some people kind of see it as a negative part of Postgres. I see it as a, a side of something we need because of some of the design decisions right at the beginning of Postgres. I personally really like it. I think we've gained so much from some of those design decisions. Um, but this one is to do with multi-version concurrency control, right? So MVCC. Um, right. the fact that we keep old versions of, I was nearly, I was about to say rows then, but I guess, uh, tuples or, around. or you say tuples or tuples. Oh, <laughs> which is correct. I say the correct. I don't know. I've heard both. <laughs> so <laughs> which we need to choose. Yeah, I th- so I'm going to say tuple. I don't know I'm why go- I, w- I will choose tuple. <laughs> okay, tuples. Uh, let's 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 use tuples. 
So right, a tuple is a physical version of a row, and each row can have multiple tuples at the same time. And uh, one transaction sees only one of them, at, at, and uh, it, it may happen that some tuple, which is physical version of a row, is not visible to any transactions, so basically it's dead, right? And uh, you can check uh, the uh, age, not the age, but the when the tuple was created, because you can select uh, x min x max CTID. We we discussed CTID some time ago. It's very convenient to know that sometimes uh, to know that there are hidden system columns in each table. They are created automatically. You cannot, for example, you cannot use CTID or x min in in your column names. So so it's like reserved words. But you can select uh, and see if the value of x min x max and the CTID. CTID is a physical address like page and offset. Uh, X mean is when uh, the transaction ID which created uh, the tuple, but X max is slightly more com complex. If it's present, like you probably already don't, cannot see the your your, it's it's usually zero it means like a row is live, but it can be not zero. It can be something different, some transaction which were uh, rolled back, which was rolled back. It means that uh, yeah, of course. So Xmax is present, you can see it in your transaction. Obviously, this tuple is live. This, like, so it, it means that when, when you select X min Xmax, uh, you deal in, in see it in row, it's you see you you have a feeling of tuple, right? <laughs> and the next time you select, you can have different values of X min, X max, X min no, but X max and CTID they can change uh, with these hidden uh, yeah. So Right. So if uh, tuple becomes dead, uh, it's a problem because uh, it, it still occupies some space. This is a key problem that that uh, leads us uh, to the, the need of uh, vacuuming, right? And also, like this very simple exercise, I recommend everyone who starts starts working with Postgres, create a, a table with just single column uh, ID integer eight, for example, and uh, put a, a row where ID equals one, and then check CTID, and then uh, just update this row, uh, not changing values, say ID equals ID, and you will see CTID will change. So this is the how you can feel that new tuple is created. Every, every time you try to do update, even if you try and roll back, Tuple, tuple will be created, uh, but new tuple will be marked dead instead of old one, right? <laughs> so I didn't example, realize that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Or you can insert an uh, inside transaction and then roll back your transaction, so cancel your insert, and this insert will produce some t tuples uh, again. This means why, like this, uh, this shows us that. Testing on production is not good. Some, some people say, oh, we will insert some data and then roll back our transaction not to, to disturb production. But you disturb anyway because you will produce uh, fresh dead tuples. And uh, yeah. you, will, will, you, will, uh, you will make a vacuum to, make, to, a vacuum to make more work than, than without your actions. Testing on production not, is not a good idea. And this, and this is... The reason we're discussing this part of it is that one of the core tasks that Vacuum has, and presumably where it got its name from, is then going and looking for these uh, dead right. tuples and uh, vacuuming them up or uh, removing them. So that right. uh, reclaiming the space, I guess, is the... Right. By the way, to one finish this idea about uh, yes, testing, uh, the only type of workload which you can do not disturbing physical uh, physical uh, layout and not not making a vacuum to work more is cancel delete. So you delete a lot, then roll back. You will produce a lot of I/O. Uh, a lot of records go will go to wall, so it, it it will put some stress to replication. But physical uh, layout won't change because your transaction will just put uh, x max new x max value. Then when it got cancelled, this uh, transaction ID uh, marked as cancelled, so it will uh, it will logically will equal to zero, meaning that these tuple these tuples are still live. So this is a very interesting kind of workload I sometimes uh, use uh, on uh, regular clones when we, we need uh, to uh, have many iterations of workload, 
but uh, we don't need we don't want uh, our physical layout to be changed so to start from the same point every time but uh, so this is the only kind of workload that won't disturb physical layout and, and vacuum right sorry for it maybe it's kind of off topic a little bit but I, I want everyone just to start thinking about uh, f- physical raw versions, which call tuples, uh, when they think about performance, because it's very, very related. You cannot uh, optimize performance not understanding M- MVCC and tuples. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So where do you want to go next? Do you want to look to talk about performance a little bit, or do you want to talk about the different... Like, uh, So one, one of Vacuum's tasks is to... Uh, free up yeah, we, we, space. which which tasks vacuum has? Uh, first of yeah. all, uh, cleaning up the tuples, 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 and second is uh, preventing transaction uh, ID wraparound, uh, which is called freezing, and third one, ad- additional additional one is uh, recalculation of uh, tuple, uh, not, not tuple stats, but uh, table statistics. There are different kinds of stats Postgres has, so. The, the statistics of data uh, to, to help the planner to understand uh, which plan to choose based on, on data st- stats, right? Yeah, this that's, is also I was going to... Yeah, so that happens if you, you, can, you can additionally do vacuum analyze, can't you? But also auto vacuum does this. So I, I wasn't right. sure if you were going to bring this up. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I switched us to auto vacuum actually uh, impl- implicitly, and this is, of course, yeah. uh, this is what auto vacuum can do. By the way, it's, it's interesting that it sometimes it does just analyze for a table when 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 time comes, right? But sometimes it, it chooses to do vacuum analyze, so both actions at once. It's interesting that both are are possible for auto vacuum. And that vacuum is great. Yeah. It allows I, I, you to forget about vacuuming. I remember times when uh, the vacuum didn't wasn't present in Postgres. So you, if by default you were in trouble, <laughs> if you don't vacuum, what happens? Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point actually. So there might be people listening who are who maybe they're relatively new to Postgres and, or they they they've started a project and they've not had to worry about. Uh, vacuum and that's probably because for s- so far at least auto vacuum has been you know it's it's got certain default settings that probably are a bit conservative in general but when you're first getting started when the tables are small um they're okay they're fine they'll keep you they'll keep this from being a problem for longer than uh, as you say if they don't have it and i think uh, as far as i can tell Unless you're extremely advanced and know exactly what you're doing, you really shouldn't be turning auto vacuum off. Um, so that it, if anybody suggests doing that, uh, that should set off uh, warning, uh, big big sirens and warning warning signals at your place of work. I think. Right. Well, uh, in my opinion, based on my like seventeen plus experience of working with Postgres in uh, quite large setups with. Hundreds, thousands, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, multi dozens of terabytes of data, and so on. In all TP context, when a lot of users are present and they need very good performance. So my experience, my opinion is uh, default uh, is not enough for almost any, any, everyone. So so it, it should be tuned in the very beginning. For example, uh, only three auto vacuum workers is not enough for modern servers. Okay, if if it's if it's a laptop or some very very small uh, system, three workers is probably enough. But since every time you produce the tuples, and we discussed, just discussed you, you many transactions produce the tuples, you need cleanup. So it means that cleanup is almost like constant work that Postgres needs to do. So my recommendation is check how many cores you have and uh, allocate at least thirty percent of those cores to to vacuum. So if you have twelve cores four workers if you have uh i don't know like 40 um, how many like 96 scores uh it means that you need uh, to have ten. 30 th- 30 workers like 10 minimum but 30 30 workers at least if, if you have a very big server and uh i'm i'm excited to see that some uh some settings default settings were recently changed uh Cost limit, auto vacuum, uh, it's, it's very complex. Like, uh, it's very 
one setting depends on another and so on but uh, roughly a cost limit and cost delay uh, associated with auto vacuum were very 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 old defaults and uh, roughly speaking uh, you had only eight maybe bytes per second of reads uh, for all workers that you have not more this is like quota uh, and uh, it was changed in postgres maybe 12 or or, or Plus, plus minus one, uh, and it was like became ten times more. So now, now roughly eighty max per second, but it's not enough for nice. big, big setups with modern disks. You probably yeah. want like half a terabyte or even even bigger uh, quota. So you need to tune it further. Yeah, there were tons of there were loads of. I think there were quite a few yeah. good tuning guides, aren't there? Uh, we could, I can link to it. I know at least well, one really good one in terms of giving people advice on what. To, I um, like a couple of articles on on from um, uh, um, from. I don't remember who who wrote it, but it was on second quadrant uh, blog. Uh, when not vacuum doesn't yeah. vacuum. When vacuum does does vacuum. Understanding basics of vacuuming. This is this is like very like great basic material. And I, if, I even open it very often when I need to explain something to others. I always mention this, these couple of posts. So let's link them in, in, in and encourage everyone to, uh, to read it. But I also wanted to say that like, if you don't tune it in the very beginning, bloat will come, right? Eventually. Yes. The two risks, right? right? Transaction zero so, well, quick... and bloat. Two risks. Yeah. Um, and that like that manifests itself in gradually, gradually slower performance, or you know, di like various things will start to degrade at that point. Disk like will start to increase. Like there's there's a few different ways that that will manifest. Um, and I, I actually wanted to say like oh, before we move on from auto vacuum, the the best advice I ever heard was, it's a bit like exercise. If you if it hurts, you're not doing it enough. So it's the if if auto vacuum looks like it's you know getting in the way of things or if it looks like if if you so sometimes i think people see it running and that's blocking other things or it's taking ages things like that <laughs> if you're in that situation don't turn it off i think some people get tempted to to turn it off so, so that the problem goes away yeah. the the solution is more make it more aggressive Opposite. make it happen Opposite. more frequently exactly so right. um that that seems to be what, what trips people up um, around this. Yeah, and then, funny word. Then, it, Fu then the opposite. Funny word when I describe what to do with auto vacuum, I also use uh, aggressive. And sometimes some company they have uh, interesting like uh, bot in, in Slack that say, well, you know, you shouldn't use word aggressive. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> choose another one and there are options. <laughs> but I agree. Like auto vacuum tuning is, is two things: make it aggressive, move faster. Right, so aggressive, like what does it mean? M move faster, so gi give more quota. Don't limit re uh, risk discretes and so on. And cost limit, cost delay. Uh, these s like set of settings, there are several settings. Uh, so also auto vacuum settings depend on vacuum settings. If it's, it's minus yeah. one, it means get it from there. So like it's, that's why I, I see I say it's quite complex. You need to to spend some time understanding these like hierarchy of settings. But uh, this is one thing. Another thing is to to make it happen f uh, often, frequency. So like speed, quotas, aggressiveness, and frequency. Frequency is very important because if you, if you allow it to move fast, but it, you keep a defaults like ten percent of the tuples, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, one percent below uh, for LCP, we need to go down. Like we need to uh, remove the tuples more often. Yeah. So just for anybody wondering, that's like by default. I think all tables, uh, so the uh, basically any table has to grow by ten percent in order for it to k trigger another auto vacuum. Which when has, when the table is a hundred or a thousand, sorry, uh, needs to accumulate at least ten percent of that tuples. Great point. Yes, right. uh, which is it very can, different. It, it, it can grow, uh, for example, a append only situation. It was fixed, by the way, in Postgres thirteen, maybe when. When yeah. uh, this analyze part of auto vacuum didn't trigger because we ha don't have that tuples and special setting was added at additional logic for append only situations. 
but the, the the like at least ten percent of dead tuples by default, and, and in my opinion, it should be one percent in the OTP. At or least, maybe, maybe not maybe even the, like the should world. it def should it definitely be a percentage? Like I've seen people switch completely to a raw number of tuples instead, right. so they they right. don't have this degradation over time as it as it. Right. Um, so yeah, it, it's also, it's broke. also not it's also not simple. There is scale factor, also set of settings for for analyze for vacuum part, and also there is a threshold. Threshold is like some absolute number, like fifty by default. As I remember, fifty the tuples, and uh, there is some formula based on these two based of these two settings that gives you a real threshold that when like de defining when that vacuum triggers. Uh, well, this static uh, number approach is, you know, like there are many topics people have different opinions about. For example, some I, I see s several groups of people, and I see, still see them, that say uh, uh, that vacuum, default auto vacuum is a very uh, silly algorithm. Uh, for example, it doesn't understand that on, on weekends we have much more space for work for auto vacuum, or at nights. It's, it doesn't respect the time of day or of week or, or of the day of week. And we should change it. So they switch off auto vacuum and uh, implement their own uh, algorithm and run vacuum. Or they do both. <laughs> right. Both, both seems like really smart to me, right? So if you, if you know when your business period, like when your business is quiet and you can afford most of the time to be able to do a, um, a manual vacuum analyze, it's not that you're doubling the work by keeping auto vacuum on because when auto vacuum then does trigger, it has less to do. It, there's there's less work. So I, I do see the logic to that um, myself. Yes, yeah. Also, uh, if you do it um, with your script, you it means that you run so-called manual, of course, it's a full automated in this case, but it's so-called manual vacuum. And in recent versions of Postgres, it has benefit and like uh, auto vacuum, it can uh, process indexes of a table in parallel so multiple uh, processes and it's like parallelization is a great way uh, to improve uh, vacuuming on larger setups it's it's inevitable way i would say and it it leads us to the topic of partitioning but maybe let's a little bit postpone yes. it right right but uh, i agree well, that's well i actually... don't i i don't like the idea of turning auto vacuum completely and relying on your custom in house tool it may be dangerous but combination sounds good but uh, if you run vacuum you, if you connect connect to postgres using psql and run vacuum it's unthrottled oh throttling is a good way is a good way to name quotas differently right so yeah i, I i'm interrupt i interrupted right uh, you no? froze i couldn't I froze. sorry i lost you for a few seconds so so right so um throttling uh, auto vacuum is throttled too much by default, but manual vacuum is not throttled at all because vacuum uh, cost delay is zero by default. It means that throttling is not applied. And my question is like, my question is, uh, can you put your system down in terms of saturation of disk IO, just doing some vacuum, maybe in multiple uh, processes, mul multiple tables at once. I, I tried I, I, on modern hardware on, on like NVMe disks. I could not do it. <laughs> Maybe on older hardware it's possible. I saw problems related to performance when vacuum was too aggressive, right? Uh, moving too fast, taking too, too much strong. disk. Yeah, using too much of our disk yeah. your capacity. But uh, on modern disks, we, we recently tried it. Like we tried to prove that uh, uh, unleash. Auto vacuum is not a good idea, but we failed. All, we always had room, even if we used like almost all, all CPUs are doing some work. It's interesting. Maybe I'm wrong but here. It's 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 an interesting uh, exercise to see where that sounds is. like. A, that doesn't mm -hmm. sound like a failure at all. That sounds like a successful experiment where you learned something really important. Well, the, the, there is always bottleneck somewhere, right? If we cannot uh, saturate yeah. our disk IO, it means that probably we have some, we, we spend some time in code, so loading CPU more than could be. Like I don't know. Like it's interesting. Uh, I just I'm, I'm just trying to say that on modern disks, 
uh, you probably should <laughs> almost unleash it to move faster. If yeah. you, especially if you have a lot of cores. Yes, yeah. awesome. Mm-hmm. There were a couple more. So I think partitioning actually might be worth discussing briefly, probably not the depths of it, but I think a lot of people think partitioning is going to help them with performance. And my experience is different. My experience is the main argument for it is all around maintenance. It's all around being able to delete. Yeah, go, I'm getting a big yes thumbs up no. here. So yeah, go on. Yes, yes and no. So I agree. Like B3 is great. It grows, the, the height of B3 grows very slow. So if we have uh, 100 gigabytes, if we have 10 terabytes, the difference is not that big. We, have, we need just additional uh, um, buffers to be checked uh, to perform index scan, right? Uh, index only scan, yep. if you talk about it. But uh, the problem is definitely related to maintenance uh, because if we need, if we have ten terabyte table, um, a vacuum is taking a day, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> depending on, on your speed and, and uh, power of disks and, and CPU and so on. But uh, like, it's it's a problem Not partition itself. Partition table, right? Not partition, of course. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand like how mm-hmm. partitioning can be connected to vacuuming and uh, one, wh- how yeah. partitioning can help vacuum. Of course, if a table is partitioned, uh, the problem is that auto vacuum cannot uh, process uh, even indexes of a table yet. It, maybe it will be implemented in future because a uh, regular vacuum can do it. But also, like even if it processed uh, the indexes in parallel, for example, you have 10 indexes and you process... Uh, using 10, 10 CPUs, 10 processes, right? But uh, heap itself, it can be, it, like, it's hard to parallelize it. Also, I think it's possible, but it's maybe, like, it's complex task. So right now, it's not possible. So if you have um, a huge table, it, the, it, the, the process of vacuuming it, it with all its indexes will be single-threaded by, by auto-vacuum. auto-vacuum. Uh, but if it, you partition it, you can benefit from, ha- from having many auto-vacuum workers. If you, of course, if you tuned it from default three to a bigger number, and you should on larger systems. Yeah. So this greatly improves the speed of vacuuming. But not only this. Uh, of course, if your table is partitioned, you can re index and create index or recreate indexes uh, much faster. But also, the state of. Actually- right. So, sorry, the state of cache improves because the, 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 like you have uh, data is localized much better. New data is present in pages where mostly new data. Well, some pages have old data. And if these tuples, tuples are not changed in, in some page, it's, it's all frozen, all visible. Autovacuum skips it, right? It's so good, and maybe it's even not present in cache, so you have space for more more space in your buffer pool and page cache for newer data. So, cache effective efficiency increases as well, right? And this directly yeah. improves performance. But also, one topic I only recently realized is that uh, in indexing and reindexing, it uh, it affects vacuuming. If indexing, if creation of some index or recreation of some index takes hours, during this period, vacuum cannot delete freshly dead tuples. Tuples which became dead tuples, which became dead only recently. Right? And this is a problem. Because indexing and indexing, they hold X min horizon, so called. <laughs> right? And uh, auto, e- vacuum. Even if it's concurrent. Yes, concurrently as well. There was an attempt to uh, imp- optimize this in Postgres 14 yeah. for uh, index and index concurrently. And uh, it was so great. Like, index and index concurrently, create, they, they don't hold XMIN tuples, so all the tuples which became uh, dead recently, Vacuum can clean them. Great. But in recently, uh, in, in June, uh, in Postgres uh, 14.4, Immediate fix. Uh, this this triggered this uh, release, as I understand. Uh, immediate fix, uh, bug fix uh, needed, and this functionality was reverted in Postgres 14, unfortunately. So the rule of thumb: be, you because... don't want index creation to be very long. Uh, so you need yeah. partitioning for faster vacuuming to yes. to run it parallel. And we're and back to, there. 
to avoid bloat because One, what like we didn't discuss what bloat yeah. is right bloat happens when you accumulate too many dead to to tuples right and then a vacuum delete them a lot of them at once and you have a lot of space free space inside pages Yes, and and I think we probably should, uh, because we're on the topic of indexes, talk about we, we've talked mostly about table bloat so far, so uh, ver row versions, uh, dead row versions, but there are also there's also index bloat, which is subtly different in my opinion, because you can you've got the same entries, but remove like freeing them up doesn't do as much uh, good as in in the table or is in the in the heap in the heap they can be reused very easily another a row can a row version can be inserted there uh, it doesn't matter what but in a in an index because it's uh it or it, in a b tree index for example adding more uh adding more rows can split pages and vacuum won't unsplit the pages so uh, even if you vacuum yeah. Uh, Not, uh, as Vacuum very strongly or very aggressively you w it does yeah exactly you won't get it back to the same size as it was it, it, at first and therefore you might need to re-index from time to time in order if you want to remove index bloat as well or or you can stay on as on top of it as you can and there's some good optimizations for this in postgres 13 i believe um mm -hmm. may, maybe 14 um yeah, so, we talked yeah, about it's it. It's just something that people sometimes in, don't realize. In both, in both uh, B3 optimizations, I think they started in Postgres 12 even, in or 13. And uh, uh, we discussed it with uh, on on uh, on Postgres TV channel with Anastasia Lubenikova and then with Peter Gagan. It's, it's, it's like so great uh, that these yeah. optimizations happen. That they're very That's... fundamental, affecting a every Postgres setup. So good, deduplication and so on. I, I agree, but uh, I think uh, bloat sometimes is useful both in heap and, and uh, indexes. For like, if in heap it can help to have more often uh, heap only tuple updates, more optimized updates, not, not without need to touch indexes. But in indexes, I think it's also useful. Otherwise, why do we have default fill factor in indexes ninety, not hundred? Right, I'm not like, like yeah. I'm not expert in indexes. Uh, we have other experts uh, like Peter Gagan or uh, and Andre Borodin, for example. Or, like by the, the way, um, indexes is a great set of topics. Right, we we should talk about them at some point. But yeah. uh, but but related to vacuum, I, I think you're right. Uh, over time, indexes uh, health degrades anyway even in like in, in modern versions latest versions of postgres it's much better situations impro improved bloat growth decreased but still we need to perform so-called index index maintenance and rebuild indexes from time to time anyway even if our auto vacuum is well tuned yeah. and uh, we have the latest version we still need to rebuild indexes and when we rebuild indexes we want to be very fast because of X min horizon because we affect uh, all tables. By the way, so if we have if we rebuild one index and if it takes many wow. hours, all indexes in our database are affected. So vacuum cannot clean tuples in all tables, all, all indexes, freshly dead tuples and entries to to that, that tuples. So it's it's huge global problem. So you want indexing to be fast. Totally Super bold. interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I had one, yeah, I had one last thing that I thought we couldn't do that we couldn't finish this episode without talking about briefly, and or even if it's just a public service announcement. Um, the there is a there is a parameter for vacuum, or there's a a diff. I think it should really be called a different thing, but it's it's called vacuum full, and you probably never want it. Like I, it. Uh, you, I could imagine people very happily using Postgres for decades and never using it. But I, I just wanted to say, because I think it can trip people up thinking, well, like the name suggests that it's going to do very, a very comprehensive right. version of vacuum. But um, I use it all, all, all the time. I use it all the time. I use it all the time. Go on. Really? What for? I do. Well, um, are you joking? How, uh, I'm interrupting again. 
can't tell if you're joking. So I need to restart the router itself. Sorry, interruption. Uh, so I use it all the time because it's related to how we estimate, how we see how much bloat we have. You know that bloat estimation is not a simple task. Uh, scripts, all everyone has various versions of scripts. They can be very, they are lightweight, but they are very, can be very wrong. For example, I, I can show you how I can. Uh, this, this script says we have 40% of bloat, but bloat is zero because the table is just created. It's easy to do. It's related to alignment paging. paging. So if you want to understand real bloat numbers, the only, there is a PGSA tu tuple, tuple, tuple exten extension, but I had issues with uh, using it some time ago. So since we are big fans of real experimenting and using clones and thin clones, thick clones, doesn't matter in this case, what, we, what do we do? We just create clone and promote it to primary, so it's a real clone writable and we vacuum full whole database or specific tables and we compare numbers before and after size right and we can say 100 percent we know that bloat is this current bloat is this it takes time of gotcha course. so right. and and also presumably we're talking about in test environments here we're of not course talking about, detached yeah. uh, instance not it's it's not test because it's yeah. production data but it's like uh, closer to production to uh, perform a real to, to get a real measurement of vacuum. Yeah. This is very simple, straightforward, brute force approach. Yeah. Awesome. So it's um, useful. <laughs> right? Yes. I, okay, I agree. I was thinking uh, purely for production use case, but you're 100% right as usual. Um, what is there anything else you wanted to make sure we talked about today? No, let's, let's make some summary, maybe like recommendations. Uh, understand MVCC. Of course, right? Mm -hmm. It's like read about it, understand. Uh, there are many good materials around. Then uh, tune auto vacuum. And then there are, there are there is a separate topic of monitoring. Maybe next time, right? Also run yeah. re recreate indexes from time to time, probably in automated fashion. It's all it's an, not a simple task. Also worth a separate discussion. Uh, and maybe use some tools like PG Repack or P PG Squeeze uh, to. Uh, to deal with bloat uh, in in tables themselves, right? What else? Ah, partitioning. If if you, if it, there's a rule yeah. of thumb, uh, it's like an empiric rule, uh, not based on uh, like some logic, but it's based on experience of many people. If the table grows so and ha or has chances to grow over hundred gigs, it should be partitioned. Right. Yeah, I like this. And I think you had one more rule, didn't you? Like, so it's uh, if you're thinking about 100 gigabytes, think about partitioning. If you're thinking about a terabyte, think about sharding. sharding. Was that your rule? Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, yeah. it was a uh, discussion on Twitter. It's not my rule. It's, it's like it started okay. in different places and then... Yeah. Good. Sounds good. It's easy to remember. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thanks again to everybody who's been sharing this on Twitter and uh, wherever else. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, looking forward to talking to you again next week. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye.